So greetings and welcome to the monthly lecture series at the Champaign County History Museum. My name is Tom Kuyper, as TJ has said, and today I'll be talking to you about the history of the Urbana Free Library. Most importantly, the construction of the current library, which we're coming up on the 100th anniversary. Uh, I am a Master's of Library and Information Science student at the University of Illinois. I also have a Master's of History from Purdue University with focuses in urban history, public history, and community studies. And I recently completed a research practicum in the Champaign County Historical Archives at the Urbana Free Library dedicated to uh, two exhibit projects honoring the 100th anniversary of the library building and just the history of the library in general. Um, so today I will discuss the results of that research. So the first documented library in Urbana was the 1854 Urbana Library Association. Uh, we have a list of the original members in the archives, uh, which included Joseph O. Cunningham, who uh, later on became a pretty major contributor to the Urbana Free Library. Um, this was most likely a subscription library organized for, by Urbana citizens. There's not a terrible amount of information about it. In 1872, there was rekindled interest in a library by a group known as the Young Men's uh, Urbana, hold on a second, <laughs> Young Men's Library Association of Urbana. 52 young men, mostly in their 20s, uh, met in early December of 1872 in Busey Hall and created a joint stock association with each member contributing $25 to begin the group. Uh, by January the following year, they raised enough money uh, and the association opened a subscription library in Urbana and changed their name to the Urbana Library Association, very similar to the 1850s group. The reading room was officially opened to the public in February of 1873 and the remainder of the library opened in May with Frank M. Allen as the first librarian of this subscription library. Books and magazines were donated by members and community members, uh, and other content was purchased with the subscription funds. In 1874, the local government became, an open, became interested in opening actually a, a public library rather than a privately owned uh, subscription library. So on June 1st, the city council proposed a new free public library in uh, Urbana, and a week later the proposal was approved. Another week later, the ordinance for the establishment of the library passed, and the Urbana Free Library was born June 16, 1874. From its inception, library funding was supported by a mill tax. The one mill tax collected $1 <laughs> for every $1,000 of assessed property value in Urbana annually. <clears throat> this money was used to support the library in every way, including rent payment, buying books, supporting the librarian, subscribing to magazines and other things like that. It just supported all functions of the library. So the first librarian that they hired was a gentleman named Samuel H. Hooks. Sam Hooks was a University of Illinois civil uh, engineering student, and he lied about his credentials. He said, I believe he had seven years of, library, of working in a library, and they hired him, and they quickly learned that he was not what he said he was. So they asked him to vacate his position, and they hired Ida Haynes, this woman, right here. She was the second librarian after Sam Hooks and uh, eventually was the longest tenured librarian. She uh, held the position from 1874 until 1924, so quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> Haynes was a cousin of future uh, Urbana Free Library supporter and board member um, Minnie Jakes, and she was also a niece of Frank Jakes, one of the members of the Young Men's Association and the first treasurer of the library who held the position until 1896. Um, Ida was, uh, began her career in November of 1874, and she was the head librarian through every known iteration of the library. Now, the first location of the Urbana Library was on the second floor of Tiernan's Block on Main Street in 1872. It wasn't here for very long. This building still stands. It has a renovated front, and it houses what most of us would probably know as Crane Alley, the bar, and the restaurant. Um, after four months, it moved just down the street to the Masonic Temple, which has since been demolished. It's the former Busey Bank, and it currently holds the parking lot of the modern Busey Bank. But uh, the library was here for uh, four years, and it once again moved just across the street to the Guild Building, which most of you probably know as the Nobleton and Bennett Building, which also still stands today, although it doesn't look like this at all. Um, <clears throat> Hold on here, let me find where I am. So uh, the library in the Guild Building occupied uh, a 28 foot by 38 foot back room on the second floor for a cost of $150 a year. As the library continued to expand and more space needed, and 
the, uh, the library needed to change locations again. This was supported by an expansion of the one mill tax into a two mill tax. This helped the library move to the first floor of the Urbana City Building in 1894. Library attendance greatly increased following moves, something many attributed to the library's location being on the first rather than the second floor, so it just had much easier accessibility. <clears throat> it initially occupied a single room, but an addition was added to the west side of the building to make more space for the growing library and growing collection, increased number of patrons. Excuse me. Library growth steadily continued into the 20th century, and the two and uh, they eventually opened up a second room on the west side of the building. Things continued to grow, and the two rooms failed to meet the needs of the growing population and the needs of the community. And also, there was a secondary issue that the library was actually housed above the police station, more specifically the bullpen. So there was common complaints that readers were interrupted by the drunks that were spending the night uh, in the bullpen and other loud uh, individuals. So uh, the combination of the lack of space and the loudness uh, motivated uh, urban citizens to want a new library, a library that was independent, one that wasn't uh, part of another building like the Masonic Temple or Tyrion's Block or something else, one that was its own structure. So, a proposal for a new library building came in 1908 by the Urbana Commercial Club. This is the first piece of evidence we have of this new proposed library that we know as the Urbana Free Library. It has this list of things that they want to do in the upcoming year, one of which, which is very small, proposed new library. Just a little piece of ephemera, just a pamphlet I found, but it's the first evidence I have in 1908. So, in order to build the library, the commercial club reached out to Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a very well-known, uh, just national philanthropist, very wealthy man, uh, and he was also very well-known for gaining, donating money to build libraries in communities that cannot afford them. So in 1910, uh, or I'm sorry, the commercial club actually wrote to Andrew Carnegie and asked him if he would support the library. Two years later, in 1910, Carnegie's secretary responded and said that they would be willing to pay for the cost of the building of the cost of the final structure. Um, after a year of planning and searching for a new site, the city of Urbana announced that Andrew Carnegie would sponsor the new library at a building cost of $40,000. In 1914, a proposal was made to the Urbana citizens asking them, <clears throat> asking them to pass a $10,000 bond measure supporting uh, the Carnegie Library building site. This was actually the first proposition in the history of Urbana for which women were permitted to vote and it, was, and it passed with an overwhelming majority. And here's a little article talking about how it was in fact the first occurrence of women being permitted to vote in the city of Urbana. Um, the site itself purchase was initially on High Street. It was uh, known as Lot 53 and the east half of Lot 52 of James T. Rose's second edition. It was on the 200 block of High Street and they purchased it for $3,500. After further, further consideration of the building committee, they pretty much established that the site would not be large enough to house the library they wanted to build. So they decided to sell that site and uh, purchase another one. Uh, the site that they purchased is what we know of today on the corner of Race and Elm Street. And let's see if I have this. And this was the corner of Race and Elm Street. This was Grandma Goodrich's house. I could not find her first name, but. Uh, and I believe this is Grandma right here. But uh, this is the corner of Race and Elm. You can actually see it says Race Street right here, and the other sign for Elm is right here on this tree. Um, <clears throat> so the main lots here were purchased in 1914. They were owned by uh, a gentleman named S. E. Huff and his wife, Lois P. Huff. Uh, the first section was purchased in April of 1914 for $7,000 and included uh, 85 feet of lots 6 and 7 of James T. Rowe's first edition. And then a second section was purchased a month later for $3,000, bringing the total cost up to $10,000, the amount of the bond measure. Um, three years later, they actually expanded the site a little bit more. They uh, purchased just a, a little bit more from lots 6 and 7 from J.R. Dunlap and Mary J. Dunlap for just a single dollar. I don't really know how they bought it for a single dollar. So the combined purchases for the site totaled $10,001. Uh, so once the site was finalized, the library committee continued planning the new library building, and they were shocked by news that Andrew Carnegie withdrew his offer. He would no longer donate the money to build the new library. He learned that Urbana raised $10,000 to build a new library, and he determined that that was uh, too large of a sum of money and that if they could raise that much money they could build their own library. 
Uh, in response, W.E. Coffin, the chairman of the Library Building Committee, said, Andrew Carnegie could take his blood money and go to hell. <laughs> Urbana is going to build a library with Urbana money, and Urbana is going to own it. Some of the major supporters and contributors to the Urbana Free Library during the time and beyond included George M. Bennett, Minnie Jakes, and Frederick Eubling. And here we have George and Minnie right here. They were involved with the library since the late 19th century and were key to the construction of the new library. Bennett, right here, he was born in Champaign in 1863 and studied to be a pharmacist and uh, took his first position in Bloomington at a drugstore in 1885. Two years later, he moved to Urbana and uh, he purchased half interest in a drugstore in the Gill Building, what became known as the Knowlton and Bennett Building. Therefore, in 1887, he purchased the building that housed the library. Um, as a supporter of the library, Bennett was a part owner of the former location, of course, but he was also a member of the commercial club that proposed the first library, uh, the first new uh, construction. He was a member of the library building committee uh, for that new building, and he was also a member of the library board of trustees for 45 consecutive years. So throughout his entire life and career, he was a major supporter of the library. Minnie Jakes uh, moved to 207 West Elm Street in Urbana when she was two years old. This house was famously directly behind the library. Uh, she, received her, she received her education from the University of Illinois, graduating in 1886, and she was the first cousin of Ida B. Haynes, the second librarian. And Ida actually lived in the house with Minnie her entire life as well, from what we know. Um, her father, Frank Jakes, was a key member in the Young Men's Library Association. He was actually the first treasurer of the Urbana Free Library, and he held that position until 1896 when he became ill. And when he became ill, they, uh, Minnie actually took, her, took his position, and two years later, the, um, let's see where I'm at here, two years later, the city council actually approved her position as the new treasurer for the library. Uh, as library treasurer, Jix was involved with nearly every major library project uh, and proposal throughout her tenure, including being a member of the building committee for the new library that eventually became the Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library. She held her position as treasurer for 50 years. In a letter given to Jake during her memorial in honor of her 50 years as treasurer, the city thanked her for her dedication to the library and her years of service. They said, you have seen the library grow from its very founding. You have seen its inadequate quarters in the city building when Mrs. Busey gave the, fundings, gave the funds for a memorial to her husband, General Samuel T. Busey. You helped plan the beautiful building in which the library is now housed. The next individual here, Fred Eubling, Frederick Eubling, he was born in Lowenburg, Prussia, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in 1841, and he moved to the United States when he was 12. He started working for the local druggist J.W. Jequith within weeks after arriving in Urbana. Despite criticisms from patrons about his non-native tendencies and language barrier, he quickly learned the trade and quickly learned English. Uh, by the age of 21, he was a qualified druggist, and he enlisted in Illinois Voluntary Infantry in support of uh, the Union in the Civil War. When he returned, he became the Urbana City Treasurer, and as Urbana City Treasurer, he approved the uh, Urbana Free Library and its founding. He, was, uh, he wasn't part of the Young Man's Library Association, but he was a ma major part of the local government that supported that library. Um, in the 1890s, he continued to support the library by working actually directly with Ida Haynes in the library. He mended and organized books, and he was also a member of the Library Board of Directors from 1898 until his death in 1911. Upon his death, he left a perpetual endowment of $10,000 to the Urbana Free Library in his bequest, along with his entire library of books. He hoped that these funds were to be used solely for the purchase of books for the library, approved by the librarian. With dedicated supporters like Bennett, Jakes, and Eubling, the new library was bound to succeed, despite Carnegie's, Carnegie's refusal to help. So following Carnegie's funding withdrawal, the Library Building Committee refused to abandon the project. They spent two years saving money from the two mill tax and collecting donations to keep it alive. In October of 1916, the, com the committee announced plans to go forward with the project in the spring. In early January, they determined that the $40,000 needed to, uh, to build the library would be raised through subscription and possibly another bond measure. Uh, but fortunately, the committee did not need to resort to these measures. Our band of philanthropists and social advocate, Mary Busey, stepped in and helped. And there she is. Okay, so before I continue on with the history library, I want to tell you a little bit more about Mary Busey, considering that she donated the library and she might be one of the more important people we're discussing today. 
So Mary, obviously, was born in Delphi, Indiana in 1854 to Abner and Catherine Bowen and attended Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, the first degree-granting college in the, to women in the United States of America. Uh, at the age of 23, she married Civil War veteran, U.S. Army General and Urbana citizen Samuel T. Busey. They had three children together, Marietta Ruth Busey, Bertha Busey, and Charles Bowen Busey, and lived at 308 West White Street in Urbana. Upon arriving in Urbana, Busey became a very, very active citizen, ultimately becoming involved in at least 20 organizations and major city projects. In 1888, she joined the First Presbyterian Church, a congregation for which she would sponsor and build a new church 14 years later. In 1906, she became a member of the University of Illinois Board of Trustees, the first year women could run for the Board of Trustee positions. Busey was a leader in the Urbana community. Her presence and impact was felt throughout the city during her lifetime and beyond. In support of women's rights and suffrage, she was a member of the Illinois State Suffrage Association. She was an organizer and first president of the Women's Relief Corps local tra chapter. She was a founding member of the Urbana Women's Club, member of the Dames of Loyal Legion, member of the League of Women Voters of Champaign County, member of the University Women's Club, uh, Urbana Women's Club member, and she was one of the first Phi Delta Theta fraternity patron patronesses and an honorary member of the Gamma Epsilon Phi sorority. Along with her membership in clubs and organizations dedicated to women's rights, Busey was also a member of a bunch of other groups, including the No Refreshment Whist Club, the Fortnightly Club, the Social Sciences Club, the Auxiliary of the American Legion, Order of the Eastern Star, the First Presbyterian Church, Twin City Club, and of course the University of Illinois Board of Trustee members. So she was very, very active. Um, so as a member of, the, member of the Fortnightly Club, she successfully pushed for household science courses to be taught in public schools, the first such courses taught in the entire state of Illinois. Um, she was also elected to six consecutive terms on the uh, University of Illinois Board of Trustees, and she was instrumental in the construction of the main library and the dormitory known as Busey Hall. Um, while a board member, she was also a part of the alumni and engineering communities, and she became the chair of the agricultural committee, but could not take that position because she passed away. Um, in addition to all this, she was also very active in the campaigns and the development of the Eastern Illinois Memorial Sanitarium, Carl Hospital, the Urbana Golf and Country Club, the Urbana Lincoln Hotel, and uh, the First Presbyterian Church, and finally, of course, the Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library, which is perhaps her greatest contribution. Uh, so in early 1917, she decided to fund this new library in full, nearly. Uh, on January 29th, 1917, she informed her grandson, grandson and library board member Paul G. Busey to inform the rest of the committee that she would donate $35,000 in honor of her late husband, Samuel D. Busey, with hopes that the library be, norm, be named after him in memoriam. Her, her gift allowed for the library building committee to move forward with the library project immediately. In February, Joseph W. Royer was appointed architect for the building, and the contract was left to A.W. Stuhlman in April. The library was underway. Now the architect hired, Joseph W. Royer, uh, was no stranger to building in the city of Urbana. He worked closely with Mary Busey on multiple projects and also built uh, many, many projects in Champaign County, or, uh, or designed rather. Royer was one of the most pr prolific architects in the history of the county. Uh, he was born in Champaign, or I think he was born in Champaign County, I think he was born in Urbana. Uh, his middle sibling, Otis Royer, was a policeman and a carriage maker. His uh, sister went to the University of Illinois and was also a member of many local groups, similar to Mary Busey. Um, Joseph Royer received his education locally. He went to the University of Illinois into the uh, engineering program, and he got a degree in architecture in 1895. And uh, he studied under Nathan Cliff. Nathan Clifford Ricker, a designer of several campus buildings and other local structures, and also the art and design building on campus is named after uh, Ricker. Um, following graduation, Rory became an engineer for Urbana, a position he held until 1906. Uh, in 1904, he opened his first architecture firm and maintained a presence in Urbana for 50 years. He ended his career in the early 1950s with his final offices located in the Knowlton Bennett Building, interestingly enough. He was also responsible for the uh, renovation of the Knowlton and Bennett building that we are familiar with today. Um, so the first structure known to be designed by Royer was the residence of Stanley Boggs. The job was commissioned in April of 1897 and construction began the following month. As the city engineer, he designed 13 residences and 17 other public and private structures. The Champaign County Courthouse. 
the Champaign County Courthouse was built in 1901, and it is honestly probably my favorite Royer building. I love it. Um, the first the Royer is the first list is first listed as an architect in 1904 in the Urbana City Directory. And the first buildings he most likely designed under his Royer and Brown firm included his own home, which still stands on 801 West Oregon, and uh, the Twin City Riding Driving Club, and finally uh, the J.R. Nelson House Remodel. Uh, some of the most famous buildings designed uh, by Royer in Champaign County include the First Presbyterian Church. It's demolished now, but he worked with it uh, directly with Mary Busey. She funded a lot of it. She also uh, gave the organ for the church as uh, a gift. Um, he also uh, designed the Flatiron Building, which burned down, unfortunately. Urbana High School, which still stands. Urbana Lincoln Hotel, which is a little covered now, but this is what it used to look like. Now there's a mall right here. <laughs> but uh, he also worked on this very closely with Mary Busey. She was actually the chair of the building committee for the Urbana Lincoln Hotel. Um, the list of known works by Royer include 53 in Urbana, 14 in Champaign, 74 in Champaign County, 110 in Illinois and 115 total uh, throughout Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. Um, and as I said, the projects he collaborated with Mary Busey include the First Presbyterian Church, uh, the Urbana Lincoln Hotel, of course the Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library, and also the uh, Illinois Memorial Sanitarium, or Eastern Illinois Memorial Sanitarium, Carl Hospital. The four buildings display very different styles from Royer's career. And for Busey, they represent some of her greatest milestones of her long-standing impressive support of the Urbana community as an advocate, member, and supporter of numerous groups and projects. In addition to the major contributions of Busey and Royer, one final person, Judge Joseph O. Cunningham, must be discussed. There's old Joe. Joseph Cunningham was born in New York in 1830 and moved around from Ohio to Vermilion County, Indiana, and finally, before finally landing in Urbana in 1853. When he moved to Urbana the same year, he purchased the local Urbana Union newspaper, uh, and he owned the business until 1858 when he decided to attend law school. During the same time period, he was a member of the uh, Urbana Library Association, the first known on paper library that we have, the subscription one. Um, in 1858, he moved to Cleveland to attend law school, and he uh, came back and opened his first law firm on May 1st. 1859 in Urbana. Two years later, he was elected as a county judge in Champaign, a position he held for four years. He was a founding member, member of the University of Illinois Board of Trustees and served from 1868 to 1873. He was also a self-proclaimed self colleague and avid supporter of Abraham Lincoln and his political ideals, but was also an anti-suffragist and an advocate of censorship. Aside from his public and political endeavors, Cunningham was known for his extensive home library. When asked why he did not vacation in warmer weather in, his win in the winter, Cunningham responded referring to his books, how could I leave my friends for such a long time? Upon his death in 1917, Cunningham left his library of 300 plus books of American history to the soon to be open Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library. In his will, Cunningham thanked Mary Busey for her library contribution and was proud that his books had a place to be, as he said, properly housed. So with Busey's donations, the hiring of Royer, the picking up of Stuhlman, the support of the Ubling Endowment, the middle tax, the books donated by, donated by Cunningham, we were underway. We had a library coming. The cornerstone of the Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library was laid on July 23rd, 1917. Speeches were given by Urbana Mayor C.W. Richards and library board members Edmund James and George Bennett. A bronze box of various local materials related to the library building community was laid in the cornerstone and construction began. In January 1918, the library reached out to the community for book donations to fill the new library. In March, the library experienced a minor setback when one-third of the new furniture arrived in a train car completely destroyed. Uh, just a minor setback, they were able to contact the manufacturer right away and they had new furniture sent immediately. Work proceeded, swift, proceeded swiftly and the committee planned an opening ceremony for early July. The Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library then opened Monday, July 8th, 1918, and it looked like that, which many of you were probably familiar with. The Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library uh, opened on July 8th, as I said, and for the opening reception, library members uh, decorated the interior of the building with ferns and displayed flags of allied nations. They also offered a special edition of the Association of Commerce Bulletin, which outlined the history of the library 
and offered a description of all the new services offered and the hours and other things involved with the new library. Um, Mary Busey, Mary E. Busey was a, of course present uh, on this day and she was presented with a bouquet of flowers from the Social Science Club in honor of her uh, donation. There was music furnished for the event and the local Boy Scouts of America patrolled the building throughout the day. The library was open from 2 to 5 p.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. on opening day and saw approximately 125 visitors. Uh, the following day, it was opened as like a second uh, opening day celebration day. Uh, the afternoon was reserved for children, but then in the evening from 7 to 9, it was open again for adults. Uh, and then on July 10th, uh, just two days after its opening, the library opened for good, and the library hours were 2 to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and 2 to 5 p.m. on Sunday. So right from the beginning, seven days a week. The building was designed in classical revival style. Uh, dimensions for the building measured 103 feet, six inches by 97 feet. The building was made as fireproof as possible with concrete and Bedford stone terraces on the north and east parts of the building. The pa patrons entered the library through both doors flanked by Doric columns. Um, the main floor was raised above ground level, and the main memorial room was finished with pink Tennessee marble on the floors and the walls, and there was also a dome ceiling in this memorial room right in the center, dome roof. South of the main room was a magazine room, children's room, and cataloging room. North of the main room was a general reading room and a reference room. Finally, the book stacks lay to the west of the memorial room. The lower floor included a large lecture room, book stacks, an unpacking room, storage rooms, and the English room, which was devoted to the Champaign County Historical Society. The building received an addition and a renovation in 1975, which made it have this kind of weird, odd, modern look. And then it was once again renovated and uh, expanded in 2005, and it returned it to the structure look that we are familiar with today. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> Saturday, July 7th, we will be continuing the celebration with a more extensive thing. I uh, developed the two exhibit cases that will be displaying information related to this. And there's also some activities and some other things going on. We put together a coloring book. It's very good. I implore you to come visit the library on July 7th, 1 to 5.30 p.m. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Questions? Anyone? This is such a wonderful, we have such wonderful libraries in this community and, and the Urbana Free Library is perhaps one of the greatest and, and one reason if you're looking for a reason to visit obviously is to go and visit the archives which is just an incredible institution um, and I'm sure you can find all of the information that you just <laughs> referenced in their holdings but yes. uh, questions? There's got to be at least a couple. Did you enjoy yourselves? Yes. That was fantastic. Thank was you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious, is the house still standing behind the museum? It's not. Behind the library? I mean, I'm sorry. It was, yes, it was, it was controversially torn down. Was it really? It collapsed at the time it was. Yeah, they were trying to move it. Oh. And at, when they're, they're in their attempt to move it and save the structure, it did collapse, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. It looks like they'll be able to save the Burnham Man <laughs> over here in part because it won't be moved that far. Right. It's very interesting, the proposal. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. I, someone had referenced that the other day in, in talking about the moving of the Burnham House. They said, well, I hope it doesn't fall apart. And I, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with the story of yeah. what had happened, so that's the reference. Yeah. That well, the Jake's house was paper thin at certain yeah. points. Brick. Yeah. yeah, and there's still one holdout on the block. There's a house built in 1872. It's a White House. Yeah. It's yeah. still resting there. Is it really that old? Well, oh, that's yeah. what it says. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best I know. You know. There are apparently four or five houses in the county that are as old as the Jake's house. The Jake's house was, I always was brought up to believe as a child when we'd go to the library, it was the oldest house in the county. Mm -hmm. And then there are three or four other ones. Mm -hmm. We had a family homestead at Homer. And I've often wondered if it still stands, and it's one of those four or five homes. <laughs> they came there in 1855. So. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, Lincoln visited the Jake's house. Really? Along with all the other houses in town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a letter in the archives that says no. as much. <laughs> I'm always fascinated to, to know the history behind Mary Busey and mm -hmm. just all of the places that 
that she touched. I mean, yeah, it's people are so yeah. People discuss so much Samuel T. Busey, mm -hmm. but this woman was busy. Yeah. Like she was part of so many clubs and organizations. Her impact on this community is yes. absolutely massive. It really is. It's, there really yeah. needs to be a lot more emphasis on on talking about the connections that she's had. I, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure we have items in our museum that were hers. I think mm -hmm. we have a few of her dresses as well. And nice. Um, and recently we were. Uh, not directly related to her, but uh, Matthew Busey, her husband's father, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, a portrait of him was just donated to us. Oh, wow. uh, nice. it, it has a considerable damage to it, but um, yeah. we're trying to find a way to get that restored, but that was just recently also donated. So uh, obviously the Buseys have a, a long history in the community. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, we're hoping as part of the, um, we won't be doing it at the dedication, but um, we believe that um, that portrait of um, Mary Busey should hang in the library. Oh, I think that would be appropriate. That she has such an important um, um, part of its history. Yeah. Um, it, that hasn't really been recognized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she hasn't been honored enough sure. for, no. you know, the library is hers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is, yeah. she did it. Where is I, it? Where's the library? Where, where's her portrait? Now? Well, the photograph. I mean, yeah. we have several photographs. Just, just getting one okay. big. We're, we're, yeah. okay. I thought you were talking about a. We want to put one out. No, no, with yeah. an actual photograph. Yeah. Yeah. We have photographs of her as a younger um, woman as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think so many people book. know of the Urbana Free Library. They just say the Urbana Free Library, but yes. the Samuel T. Busey Memorial part of it gets right. missed. Sure. And I think that's a really interesting. Did you come across any time in like the 50s or 60s when it was there ever a consideration of like maybe tearing it down? To make room for a large building that ever considered or oh man you know a bit more i don't know i never came across yeah. anything like that it, it might be out there, there was there a period of they love to tear down old buildings yeah. and oh yeah like urban renewal yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i don't think that this would have got like the bite of that because That's the true. building was not necessarily terribly old at that point in That's time true. and also it was like in a downtown area that probably wasn't like affected by any blight that yeah. urban renewal typically destroyed further <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> They just put a modern addition on test. Yeah, and it wasn't so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> looked like an alien ship yeah. landed on the library. <laughs> kind of looked like, though, I assume, maybe the champagne. Yeah, the maybe a little bit. <laughs> over here, purple carpet and such. Yes. Any other questions? Well, let's give another round of applause. Wonderful <laughs> round. Thank you. Thank you. And again, for those that may be watching this at home, um, be sure to visit us at um, ChampaignCountyHistory.org and watch for these. We have a monthly speaker series. Um, next month is going to be um, Sherry from the Urbana Free Library. She's going to be talking about prohibition, um, about the prohibition era and some of the various speakeasies um, and vice that occurred around town. And so here at the museum we're also working on a new uh, walking tour on that topic. And so uh, there'll be, that's a really fun topic to explore. So we hope you'll come back for that. Okay. Well, with that, we'll end it. But thank you again. And, well, thank uh, you for having me.